tell you a story. I was standing in a giant corridor, a hallway of sorts. It white tile extended 20 meters in front of me and behind. There was a great marble wall to my right, and on my left, 10 meters tall, panels of glass connected through old iron. I could see the afternoon sun and feel its warmth, and little tiny particulates glowing, moving brownly through the air. This peaceful moment was interrupted by a thump, 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 thump. Coming from behind me, I whipped around and was surprised to see a gigantic Tyrannosaurus Rex coming around the corner. I froze. We, we had a moment of eye contact. Mine was pretty much complete terror. I'm not sure what the T-Rex was thinking, but it took off full, street, full speed straight towards me, stopping just about arm's length away, at which point I realized I had crouched down to the ground. I was completely frozen. Because if there's anything that we learned from Jurassic Park, it's that if you don't move, T-Rex cannot see you. <laughs> so this dinosaur looked down, and it let out a tremendous roar. It was a scary roar. I could feel my heart fluttering up in my throat. And whilst I am still crouched down, it stood up, planting one tree-like limb on my right and another on the left, as it walked completely over the top of me, down the hall and around the corner. Now, I know that dinosaurs are no longer around. They've been extinct for 65 million years. But that day, when I encountered a T-Rex in virtual reality, what I knew and what I felt were disconnected. Hollywood has been tapping into this for decades, right? We empathize and we feel with imaginary characters. But in VR, the character is you. Movies unfold on a screen in front of you. VR unfolds around you. In fact, there is no screen. The screen is your world. And the incredible part of it is it allows for these amazing, jaw-dropping, like, oh my god, epic experiences in gaming, in cinematics, and in fields that I'm particularly passionate about, like data visualization and science. Since there is no screen in VR, it's really great for showing giant things. Dinosaurs, spaceships, the brain. We may not think of the brain as being particularly big, but the cool thing in VR, we have what superheroes would probably dream of. We control space and time. That means that we can take a little tiny cantaloupe-sized brain and make it massive, allowing viewers to appreciate the incredible complexity held within. Now, your brain contains about 80 billion neurons connected through maybe 100 trillion synapses. At any given moment, there are hundreds of millions of electrical and chemical impulses surging through the wires of your brain, allowing you to comprehend and contemplate the world around you. Now, imagine if those neurons in your brain were not just visualized in a textbook or as an image or as an animation, but instead, all around you, branches extended as far as your eyes could see, and the action potentials moving through them cracked like lightning bolts across the sky. Imagination is amazing. It's kind of a preview of life's coming attractions. This is no longer imaginary. In fact, our group has been putting neurons in, virtually, in virtual reality for a couple years now. And actually, our latest experience, which debuted at Tribeca Film Festival this year, invites visitors to go into room-scale VR, where you can move around. And you actually paint with light. And you trigger a circuit that our group discovered, a circuit that responds to directional motion. It's a whole new medium for scientific discovery. Now, of course, before you visualize something, you have to have the data to visualize. We go about generating our data in an interesting way. So I come from a computational neuroscience lab at Princeton University, where we train AI to decipher out the complicated 3D structure of neurons that are found in the brain. We pair this with functional data that then allows us to model how cells do what they do. That is to say, how things that happen outside the brain get turned into electrical and chemical impulses connected through what we call a connectome within the brain. 
Now, our software is, is pretty good, but it's still not that good. It's very time consuming for us to map individual neurons. And that means that we're bound. It means that we can't ask and answer important scientific questions. So we turned our lab software into an online game, a puzzle game called iWire. And it just runs in a browser, in an internet window. We launched this project a couple years ago. And now, over a quarter million people from 145 countries have signed up. Together, the iWire community has contributed to significant scientific discoveries and has helped us create what we think is the most complete catalog of retinal cell types in the back of the eye, the most complete catalog of retinal cell types ever made. And this is a problem that has eluded science for 60 years. Now, you may think of neurons, like, okay, they're branchy cells, they kind of look like trees. They do, but there's actually lots of types of neurons. They're big and small. They're excitatory and inhibitory. They are fast and they are slow. We actually don't know how many types of cells there are in our own heads. Think about that for a minute. Like, that's insane. We can put robots on Mars. We can drive cars faster than the speed of sound. But we don't know how many types of cells there are in the organ that makes all that possible. That's changing, thanks in part to gamers. Our latest project is the museum, as you're seeing here. And it combines hundreds and hundreds of cells that our players have discovered with physiological data, like where the cells are found in the brain and what their functional responses are. This is an invaluable resource for the research community because up until about six months ago, the way that researchers teamed up to find new cell types was by emailing PDFs, emailing screenshots of cells, and sending charts. Now we have interactive browser-based tools that are not just cool for research, they're interesting for anyone who might be curious about the brain. We can visualize not just this circuit, but any circuit that is discovered that comes with 3D models. You can load up dozens and dozens of cells and go on a hunt for synapses. And nowadays, mobile phones double as VR headsets, so we're in the next iteration of this, probably gonna make it so you can just drop right into VR, fly through these neurons, and go explore the brain in a completely new way. Now, our next project that we're working on is tackling a completely different part of the brain. We just announced NEO at an event held by the White House in the United States about two weeks ago. You can see these cells have all these weird little projection things coming off of them. Those are called spines, and each one is a synapse. And they're changing all the time. As you remember what I'm saying, your brain's growing lots of new synapses. In NEO, Gamers will venture through the brain with a cute, slightly derpy AI named Misty. <laughs> it's humans plus AI plus other humans, which is the future, by the way, adding missing synapses and fixing broken branches in order to solve the puzzles of perception. We're putting all the work that we've done over the past few years together to make an awesome experience that's going to shine light on, well, how we see, how we understand, and how we perceive the world. <laughs> you see, science is stunning when you can see it. And it is design that brings that wonder to the world. Increasingly, science is becoming de-siloed. You know, traditionally, you have to be an academic, you have to have a graduate degree, you have to be incredibly focused on one field to even touch science. But now, with citizen science, open source software, open access journals, open collaborations, the whole field is changing. And that's incredibly exciting, because what really drives humanity forward is the interdisciplinarity of us. We all have our own brains that is encased in the dark cavern of our skull. But somehow, by interacting with one another, we become ourselves. We generate and share new ideas with the world. And the ideas, I think, that drive neuroscience and hopefully spark a little curiosity in you are, like, how are we human? What is consciousness? What's creativity? How does curiosity work? Well, we don't know the answers to those questions yet, but I think we will. 
And it is the interdisciplinary nature of new science, bringing new perspectives to old problems that fuels innovation. For example, one researcher at Columbia has paired VR headsets with EEG, that is an electroencephalogram, and it measures activity of neurons in the brain. They can actually detect and improve the reaction time of professional athletes. They can see how long it takes for a pro baseball player to notice a ball, a pitch coming, and adjust his swing accordingly. And if he is not doing great at that, they can train him to get better. Like that's a tool just for the elites, but it exists, which means eventually it will be for everyone. And why stop there? Wouldn't we all want to banish worry, enhance our willpower, make ourselves learn more faster? It is only a matter of time until the intersection of science, engineering, design, and creative strategy allows us to make great leaps forward that are going to transform our very lives. I just want to say that the future is going to be so incredibly amazing, and I'm so excited to be on this journey with all of you. Thank you.